Hey, SAD students, let's talk a little bit more about gathering data. Today we're talking about sampling methods, okay? So let's recall exactly what we're doing. We have a population. We want to measure something in that population, okay? Uh, and maybe we, we want to measure the mean height or IQ or weight or something in that population. We also might want to know the standard deviation or the variance. These, are, uh, these, are, uh, these tell us how spread out the measurement's going to be, okay? Uh, and in order to do that, we would have to take a uh, census, of course, where you measure the entire population. As we know, you usually can't do that. That's just not really feasibly possible. So what we do instead is we take a little sample of that. Now from the sample, there's our sample. Uh, we can also see what are the mean of our measurements, the, the average. Uh, what's the standard deviation? What's the, what's the variance telling us how spread apart our measurements are? Uh, if they're all the same number, then the standard deviation and variance would be zero. Uh, and so these numbers here are statistics, whereas these numbers over here are parameters, okay? Statistics are estimates of the parameters. Statistics being what we get when we look at our sample, and parameters being what we want uh, of the population, all right? That should be review. We've, we've, uh, we've talked about that already. Now. Before we start gathering our data, before we start sampling, before we start some sort of survey, we've got to ask ourselves some questions. Let's say I'm interested in knowing, I don't know, what, what percentage of uh, Texas voters uh, support Bernie Sanders, okay? I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. And so the first thing I want to know is exactly what is my population of interest? Well, really what I'm interested in is uh, how many people are going to vote for him uh, in the Texas primary. And so really what I'm interested in is uh, my population of interest is going to be people who are registered to vote, who plan to vote in the Democratic primary. Because if you're voting in the Republican primary, you don't get to vote for or against Bernie Sanders. So my population of interest is actually uh, Texans who are registered to vote, who plan on voting in the Democratic primary. That's my population of interest. Now the next question is, what exactly is the parameter I want to measure? Exactly the parameter I want to measure is how many people plan to vote, or what proportion of these, uh, of these people plan to vote for Bernie Sanders, okay? Not how many people respect him as a person, how many people like him, how many people are happy that he's running, but how many people actually plan to vote for him, okay? That's exactly what I want to ask. So it's really important to get those first two questions down because that makes things a lot clearer for you as you go along into the future. In, into the future. Now, what will my sampling frame be? I don't want to end up like the Literary Digest, okay? I want to make sure that the, the, my sampling frame looks a lot like my population. But how am I gonna find people to, uh, uh, to, uh, um, to talk to? Am I just gonna go out on the street? Well, then my sampling frame is gonna be people who are out on the street. Uh, am I going to have a, uh, a, a computer call a bunch of phone numbers that have um, local Texas uh, area codes? Uh, I could do that, but that means I'm only going to be contacting, that means my sampling frame is just gonna be people who have phones who have those particular area codes, because as you know, people have moved into Texas with out-of-state area codes, they still keep those area codes. So. Um, so that's, a, uh, that's an issue. Um, maybe I'll just use prior voter registration records. But if I do that, then that means I'm excluding people who are going to register to vote shortly before the election. Either way, you know, however I do it, I run the risk of excluding somebody. So I have to be very, very careful how I choose my sampling frame. Uh, next question, how big will my sample be? I'd like it to be as big as possible because that gets me as, as a, um, as specific an answer as possible, as precise an answer as possible, but I don't have all the money in the world, so again, I have to figure out uh, how much can I afford to do. And then finally, what method will I use to sample? This is what we're talking about today. We got four uh, common methods that are all uh, generally considered to be uh, very effective methods of sampling. Uh, each one of these methods uses uh, randomness, okay? Randomness, uh, well, first off, let's mention bias. We already know that bias is not our friend. 
bias is our enemy, these different types of bias, we definitely do not want those to, uh, uh, we don't want to fall victim to those. However, randomness is definitely our friend. Our sampling method must use some element of randomness in it. Now, what is randomness? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not uh, saying, oh, I think it's right here, okay? Don't let your judgment get involved at all. Randomness must include uh, a, uh, a process that is outside of your control. For example, using a random number generator on a calculator or a computer, or using a random number table, uh, or using uh, rolling a die, flipping a coin. Something like that gives you a random outcome that you have absolutely no control over. Okay, so randomness must be part of your, uh, of your design. Now, let's talk about a simple random sample, which we sometimes abbreviate as SRS. The simple random sample is really the most basic type of random sample. Let's say I have this population here, and I want to choose, oh, I don't know, five members of the population. Well, there you go. I could choose one, two, three, four, five. I could choose those, or perhaps I could choose uh, that one right there. A simple random sample is a sample where First off, anybody in the population could be chosen, and secondly, any possible combination of five might be chosen. So it could be the first one, it could be this one, it could be that one there, okay? That's what a simple random sample is. And again, any possible combination of five individuals in the population could be chosen. Now, why not always use a simple random sample? Because it really is the most random possible. Uh, the reason we don't use it, they're kind of hard to do. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's logistically very difficult sometimes. Uh, so uh, we also have a stratified random sample. Now sometimes you might be asking a question for which uh, one part of the population is going to answer one way and one part of the population is going to answer another way. Uh, let's say that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Texans the question, um, do you feel that our uh, immigration policy needs to, be, uh, uh, needs to be changed somehow? Well, I'm thinking that people who are immigrants or first-generation Texans are going to probably have different feelings from people who have been living here, their families have been living here for generations and generations and generations. So what I want to do is, in my sample, I want to make sure that both of those populations are represented in my sample, okay? So anytime you have a question for which you think, hmm, one portion of the population is going to feel differently from another portion of the population, a stratified random sample is a good idea because what I would do is I would choose a couple of people from this, uh, from this portion and I'm going to choose three people from this portion because, frankly, this one's a little bigger. I want to keep it proportional, okay? So that's what a stratified random sample would be. Uh, another example would be if I'm, uh, uh, if I am asking, uh, let's say I want to survey Texans about whether we should lower the drinking age to 18, okay? Well, in that survey, I want to make sure that I have at least some people who are 18, 19, and 20 basically in that uh, under 21 but over 18 uh, age range. Not too many, but I wanna have about the same proportion in my sample that we have in the general population because I suspect that those people might feel differently than the rest of the population, okay? That's what a stratified random sample is. Now we get to, uh, oh, we get to the cluster sample. Now sometimes people confuse stratified sample with cluster sample. They're really very, very, very different. So here we have a cluster sample. What we've done is we've taken our population and we've broken it into little clusters here, okay? I've broken it into clusters that are all about the same size. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to randomly select, uh, where is it? There we go. Randomly select one of my clusters and then I'm gonna do a census in that cluster, okay? So in that particular cluster, I'm gonna ask everybody the question. And this cluster is going to represent the entire population. Now, what's the benefit of using the cluster sample? The benefit is it's pretty easy, okay? It's way, way easier to do a cluster sample than it is to do a simple random sample. What's the downside? The downside is that that may not represent the, the, um, 
uh, the entire population very well. So what you have to do with a cluster sample is you have to be reasonably sure that all of your clusters are uh, themselves fairly representative of the, uh, uh, of the, the population in general. With a stratified random sample, you had one population, you had one portion of the population and another por portion of the population feeling pretty differently about the matter. With a cluster sample, you all want them to look kind of the same, okay? So each one of these clusters is heterogeneous itself, all right? So uh, um, there's another cluster that I might choose, and there's another cluster that I might choose, and now we get to the systematic random sample, okay? This is one that's used a whole lot. Uh, it's, it's one that is used very, very frequently in uh, voter exit polls. Uh, what you do in a, in a systematic random sample is you decide, I'm gonna ask every, I don't know, 15th person that I see, okay? Now, remember, I said every single uh, sampling method has to have an element of randomness in it, so what you have to do is the first person you ask needs to be randomly selected. Okay, I need to use a, a computer, uh, a random number generator, or something to give me that first person. Because initially, before I begin, I want every person here to have an equal chance of being chosen. So if I'm gonna choose, let's say the first 50, if I'm gonna choose every 15th person, then what I wanna do is I want a, a computer um, random number generator to give me a number between one and 15, and that'll start me off. So I would start off with, let's say, that guy right there. And then after that, I'm going to choose uh, this one. And then after that, I'm going to choose this one. And then after that, I'm going to choose this one. And so as you can see, I'm evenly spacing them apart. Now, if I'm doing that, why not just ask everybody? Well, because probably I don't have enough time. Because as I'm asking this one the questions, these other people are walking by. All right? But a systematic random sample does get you pretty good results. Okay, uh, so samples that are notorious for introducing bias. We already talked about these. Uh, no, actually, no, we didn't. Uh, a voluntary response sample, uh, anytime that you are allowing people to, to call in, uh, you're gonna have voluntary response bias, but the problem there is it's not random. They're choosing whether to participate in the sample or not. Uh, a convenience sample, this is when you just like, you go to the mall and you ask some people that you see, and generally what you do is you ask the people who, when you smile at them, they smile back. Don't do that, okay? You're just, you're, you're, you're getting bias there because again, it's not randomized, randomized, and you're gonna get all friendly people. And uh, any sample that is based on your or anyone else's judgment, you should not use, okay? You should not use it if it's based on judgment. It needs to be based on randomness instead. All right, so you got your simple random sample, you got your stratified random sample, you got your cluster sample, you got your systematic sample. These are all four uh, considered to be effective ways of sampling. All right, next video. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No matter what your sampling design, you will always have sampling variability. What sampling variability is, it means, well, let's say I'm doing a simple random sample. I, you know, if I, if I take one sample, uh, they might be all tall people. And if I take another sample, they might be medium-sized people. And if I take another sample, they might be short people. Let's say I'm measuring the height this time. Uh, there is going to be variability from sample to sample. But if I choose them randomly, the variability will actually be less than if I let my judgment get involved. But there always will be some variability, and that's okay. All right, now, next video is gonna be over experiments and observational studies. Sometimes we don't get our data from sampling, from surveying. Sometimes we get our data from running an experiment or from observing uh, data, and, uh, or from, from observing experiences. And, uh, um, well, we'll talk about that next video. See you then.